reference of the so my group at MIT is called the Atomic Architects, and these are our uh, official mascots, which are, uh, you may have heard physicists like to approximate cows as spherical. We thought, well, that's insufficient. We need a full orthonormal basis for describing our cows. So these are our spherical harmonic cows, which were designed by one of our undergrads, Song Kim. Uh, and we reside within MIT EECS and the Research Laboratory of Electronics. So without further ado, let's get to the meat of it. So. First of all, why might folks tuning into a materials project seminar be interested in Euclidean symmetry equivariant neural networks, which I will describe later? Well, they happen to be state of the art on many atomistic benchmarks. Um, and some non-exhaustive examples include uh, predicting quantum mechanical properties of molecules, such as the QM9 data set, or predicting molecular dynamics at many length scales, whether it's small molecules such as MD17, or even kind of breaking the scale at which we can even do sort of ab initio based molecular dynamics for like large biomolecules done out of Boris Kaczynski's group with um, Alby and Simon on Allegro, uh, or it's predicting other properties of materials such as phonons or magnetic structure or things relevant to heterogeneous catalysis um, using the benchmark data set, the Open Catalysis 2020, as well as actually the 2022 and the Open Direct Air Capture. Um, data sets. And then there's all these interesting things sort of in the biological sphere of protein folding, RNA scoring, ligand docking, um, and also just general molecular conformation, which is also relevant in those spaces, and then generation of these various things. So lots of, lots of reasons to potentially be interested in Euclidean symmetry equivariant neural networks or just Euclidean neural networks. So in this talk, um, I want to go over some of the properties of E3NNs. Um, what makes them different from standard neural networks, like differences in the data types, interactions, how we handle geometry in these networks, what these properties have enabled us to do, so focusing on different applications from the group, and then some open questions for folks who are kind of interested in getting into this space, where might there be kind of interesting research areas to contribute to. So without further ado. So first I wanna motivate why we're even putting symmetry into a neural network and what we get out of it. So it kind of starts with how we communicate physical systems to our friends, to our computers. Um, and that is typically we use coordinate systems to describe where things are in 3D space. So for example, I have this collection of lovely benzene molecules. And let's say I wanna to describe to my computer where they are so I can predict properties of this assembly. So I can use really any coordinate system to do so because a choice of coordinate system is fundamentally arbitrary. Coordinate systems are tools we use to describe physical systems, but they're not real. There aren't little coordinate systems running around in the universe. So I could use, for example, coordinate system one or coordinate system two. And the important thing is that they're describing the same thing. And we can always transform between these choices of coordinate systems using the symmetries of, in this case, 3D Euclidean space. So 3D rotations, inversion, which is how you get things like mirrors, um, or 3D translation, so just moving from one spot to the other. So let's say we want to do machine learning to try and predict uh, properties or generate new interesting assemblies of molecules using machine learning. And this is where we run into a problem, is that traditional machine learning sees the description of the system with coordinate system one and coordinate system two as completely different completely unrelated. It has to learn to at least emulate that it understands that they're the same physical system. Um, but this can be quite costly. So if you have a machine learning model that's not built to handle symmetry, you typically have to train it using something like data augmentation. And in 3D, especially, this gets quite expensive because essentially if I want the model to understand a 3D, this 3D box that has different colored sides, it needs to be able to see it sort of in many different orientations for it to start to get a sense that it can actually identify the box in these different orientations. It has to see it to learn it. It doesn't a priori know that things that are rotated are the same. However, if you train a model that is imbued with symmetry, it understands the symmetry of coordinate system transformations from the beginning, you only have to see one example. So it really simplifies things. And you get a bunch of robustness properties too in data efficiency. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so traditional machine learning sees this as completely different. 
I would much rather spend my neural networks energy or machine learning models energy and parameters towards learning quantum mechanics, not learning 3D rotations. We know a lot about the mathematics of 3D rotations. And so our solution to this is to use 3D or 3D Euclidean symmetry equivariant neural networks. And these models, even without training, understand that the system described with coordinate system one and the system with, described with coordinate system two are the same system, just described differently. Okay, so what does that mean? What does that get us? Well, this means that Euclidean neural networks can recognize equivalent recurring geometric patterns that occur in different locations, orientations, or even mirrors from seeing a single example. And they also generalize well to systems that have similar motifs. Um, and again, uh, this allows it to sort of generalize in a more robust fashion when we look at similar chemical systems. So in this rubidium manganese chloride crystal, we have these octahedral motifs. We have manganese octahedrally coordinated by chlorine atoms. And these motif, this octahedral motif shows up in many orientations and locations. And the model not only has the global symmetry of if I rotate the crystal, it's the same crystal, but also locally that this motif is the same as this other motif just rotated. And the sensitivity that these two motifs are rotated with respect to each other. So kind of all the things that you would, you would sort of want compositionally um, from a neural network. Furthermore, many properties of physical systems change under a change of coordinate system in kind of a complicated way. And what's great is that even without training, you know, you have the guarantee that the model will transform these quantities predictably in the way that they should be transformed. So let me give you a concrete example. So on the left, I have the simple rotation of a humble little water molecule. Looks like a fairly simple rotation. But then we look on the right, and on the right, I have the Hamiltonian matrix describing the energetics of this molecule as calculated with density functional theory. So a particular flavor of quantum mechanical calculation. The rows and the columns, each of these entries is describing an interaction between the electron on one orbital and the electron on another orbital. So the diagonals are the interactions of the orbital with itself. And then off diagonal will be things of different orbitals. And as you can notice, from this simple little rotation, these numbers in this matrix are fluctuating wildly. And again, it's really nice that our model doesn't have to waste time or parameters learning these complex transformations. Just by the way we construct this data type in our network, it automatically knows how to change this matrix under rotation. So, and, and also that it will have the correct symmetry because many physical properties have specific symmetries. And those are also guaranteed to be correct, even without training. So those are some nice guarantees. Last but not least, I mentioned this a little bit in the previous slide. Um, this is a very common thing in crystals. If you have a crystal that has inversion symmetry, it can't have a spontaneous polarization. So there's many types of selection rules and many types of physical properties that we can kind of eliminate, or we can say it does have just by looking at the symmetry of the crystal. And this stuff is already naturally built in to the model. And uh, this is actually uh, often called Curie's principle, articulated by Pierre Curie in 1894, which is when effects show certain asymmetry, effects being certain like the properties, this asymmetry must be found in the causes that gave, or the causes that gave rise to them. So things like the actual symmetry of the system of the crystal. And uh, this is the example I like to give for it. If I were to take three randomly initialized Euclidean neural networks, such that they're predicting this um, signal on the sphere. So I'm, I'm, I'm representing this as kind of this blob in the same way we represent atomic orbitals, but it's a signal comprised of spherical harmonics. And I were to input either the geometry of a tetrahedron or the geometry of an octahedron, even without training, these outputs have either tetrahedral symmetry or octahedral symmetry. And the symmetry that's outputted by the model, uh, the symmetry of the objects has to have equal or higher symmetry than the inputs. And this is the same for physical systems too. Okay, so one more thing I wanna mention. Um, in kind of the class classes of, of models where we have symmetry built into the model, there's yet another approach, which are invariant models, which is saying coordinate systems are kind of complicated. Um, why don't we just get rid of everything to do with the coordinate system and instead represent our system in an invariant way? 
using things that don't depend on the coordinate system, things like pairwise distances. Doesn't, you know, doesn't matter how you, what coordinate system you use, that pairwise distance is invariant, it stays the same. Or even angles between three atoms or three molecules in this case. So equivariant models of which you put in neural networks are, are one such type of model. Um, they keep the coordinate system around and if the coordinate system changes, the outputs will also change like that complex Hamiltonian matrix. And so we're gonna focus on equivariant models in this talk. Some properties of equivariant versus invariant models that are showing up sort of as more folks are using these models and are able to compare them that we're noticing is that equivariant models are more data efficient than invariant models. So first let me define data efficiency. So let's say I have a trained model and I wanna look at the log of the error on the validation set. So I'm testing the model. This isn't the training data, this is like the, the, the unseen data. So I look at the error on the unseen data versus the number of training examples the model was shown. The common mantra in machine learning is, well, you want a better model, give it more data. So we expect the error to go down. The reason why we're plotting this on a log log plot is that in general, we observe scaling laws such that um, the amount in which a model will increase in accuracy as a function of training examples tends to show a power law, which looks linear in log log space. Okay, now here's where we go for data efficiency. So data efficiency is a measure of how much better does my model get if I show it more data. A model that is more data efficient will have a higher accuracy gain than a model that is less data efficient. So if we were to put invariant versus equivariant models on the same plot for the same task, although this trend is robust across different tasks, we notice that um, invariant and equivariant models are both effective at many tasks. The equivariant model tends to be more data efficient. It needs less training examples to get better efficiency uh, or to get a better accuracy than, um, than an invariant model. And furthermore, there's even some tasks where we see there's sort of like different ways to be equivariant and you can kind of go into higher and higher order fidelity equivariance. And some tasks we even see that as we add in more and more complex features um, that we actually see the accuracy improves. And this is particularly um, in molecular dynamics tasks or charge density prediction tasks where angular resolution tends to be even more important um, so that's been sort of an interesting, interesting note. Okay, so now let's get to how do these things actually differ from traditional neural networks? And it's mainly in three primary ways. First, we don't just have numbers running around in our neural networks. We actually have well-defined data types that can be expressed in terms of what are called irreducible representations or IREPs for short. I'll define those in a bit. Furthermore, because we have these specialized data types, how you interact them, there's a bit more rules for how you do that. Like how do you actually interact a vector times a vector or you know, a higher rank tensor and a higher rank tensor. So there's a little bit more rules in how we do multiplication. Last but not least, the way that we interact features on atoms, for example, and the geometry of the surrounding atoms is also a bit different. And so our convolutional filters, if we choose to use convolutional filters, uh, use spherical harmonics. Um, so I'll get more into that later. Okay, let's start with your apps. A amazing result from the mathematics of group representation theory is that if you give me any type of data and you tell me that it changes predictably under rotation and inversion, I provably can break it up into these simpler data types known as irreducible representations. So no matter how complex a function you learn, no matter how complex a property, I can always break it down into these little bite-sized pieces. And these bite-sized pieces, these irreps, are defined by two numbers. Their angular frequency, which is how quickly does this group of numbers change when I change or if I rotate my coordinate system, and parity, which is if I invert my coordinate system, so I take 
x, y, z goes to minus x, minus y, minus z. So I just invert my vector. Does this quantity flip sign or not? If it does not, it is even. If it does, it is odd. OK, so let me give you some concrete examples of what these EREPs can look like. So let's start off with things with zero angular frequency. They don't change under rotation. There's two of these, one that's even. So these are scalars. So commonly known scalars, things like energy, mass, um, classification labels, if you're doing a classification task on like images. So a rabbit being in the image, doesn't matter if you rotate or flip the image, it's still a rabbit. But then there's kind of the mirrored version, which are pseudoscalars. And this would be identifying things like, this is a right hand. Well, if I mirror it, it becomes a left hand. And so it flips sign when you have an operation involving inversion. So that's a pseudoscalar. Let's go to L equals 1. These are things that change at the same rate as a change in my coordinate system rotation. We're very familiar with things like 3D vectors. So if I rotate my coordinate system, it kind of rotates along with it. But there's also the mirrored version, which are pseudo vectors. And some of you may or may not be familiar with them, um, but you probably have actually run into them. You can get pseudo vectors by taking the cross product of two vectors. So x cross y gives you z. But if you do minus x cross minus y, you'll also get z. And this is the defining difference of a pseudo vector versus a vector. If I invert it, if I invert my coordinate system, it doesn't change. And this is what we use to articulate things like cross products or rotation axes. OK, let's go to L equals 2, last but not least. Oh, well, these, the L goes up to infinity, so this is just a sampling. But for L equals 2, um, even parity. So something has L equals 2 angular frequency. It means if I flip it by 180 degrees, it still looks the same. So and a double-headed ray has this property. So let's say I want to distinguish the x direction. But I don't really care about plus x or minus x. Maybe I have a time oscillating electric field. And I'm like, well, the field is oscillating in this direction. You could represent that with an L equals 2 even object. It doesn't flip under parity. Let's look at the odd parity. It's going to kind of go it's back to the pseudoscalar thing. So a helix, like a DNA helix, if you rotate it by 180 degrees, it looks the same. But if you mirror it, it actually flips sign. So it actually changes from like a right-handed helix of going kind of up and up to being a left-handed helix. And so it's actually a distinct object. OK, so those are your ear apps. Anything of higher L, just it basically has a, a higher ang uh, angular frequency, higher rotational symmetry. But that's kind of the basic idea. So let's go to how we actually interact these little beasties. So let's start with scalars and vectors, because those are things that we're most probably comfortable with. If I take a scalar times a scalar, I still get a scalar. So regular old scalar multiplication. Similarly, if I have a vector times a scalar, I get a vector out, but it is either scaled you know, up or down depending on the magnitude of a scalar. That's what a scalar means. It can only scale the size. It can't change the direction. So this is still scalar multiplication. But once we get down to a vector times a vector, the most general operation is actually the outer product, which gives us a 3 by 3 matrix. Now, this object itself is not a scalar. It's not a vector. It's something else. It also doesn't have a singular angular frequency. However, as I told you before, we can decompose it into these little bite-sized EREPs. And when we do that, we actually get three distinct EREPs out of it. We get a scalar which is the trace of the matrix. So if you sum up the diagonals, that quantity never changes, no matter how you rotate the matrix. And this trace is actually equivalent to taking the dot product of these two vectors. So, and this is a scalar, an even, even parity scalar. Um, then there's the anti-symmetric part of the matrix, which is equivalent to that cross product. And it's a pseudo vector. Last but not least, we have the symmetric traceless part of the matrix, and that transforms as that double-headed ray. Uh, so we can kind of break this down. So it's these types of operations, this outer product plus the decomposition that we have in the network. 
One reason I really like to show this last operation is because even if you're starting off with only scalars and vectors, you actually generate these kind of stranger irrep objects. And so you don't need to worry if like your inputs aren't these complex irreps, you will generate them in the process of just interacting your data. Um, so let's go ahead to featureizing geometry, hopefully. Okay, yeah, I think, I think we're good on time. So just to maybe contextualize why geometry and features are sort of different beasts, um, the input to a Euclidean neural network is typically geometry, so where things are in 3D space, and what features live at different points in space. So let's say I have two point masses that are at two different coordinates, two different x, y, z's. And each point mass has a mass. And let's say it also has a velocity and an acceleration vector indicated by these vectors here. So in order to preserve symmetry, a Euclidean neural network needs to know something else, which is how do your features transform under rotation and inversion or parity? So for example, I have my geometry, my features, and then I have how these features transform. The first number is a scalar. The next three numbers are a vector. The three numbers after that are also vectors. So I have one scalar and two vectors. And this is what the E3NN needs to know in order to correctly treat your system. But what do we do with the geometry? Well, typically we'll use a convolution style operation to interact the geometry with the features using the multiplication operation and data types that I showed to you before. So convolutional filters, you're probably used to seeing them as like a grid that gets scanned over an image. Perfectly good picture. Only difference is that we tend to, since we're dealing with atoms, we're dealing with atomistic systems, uh, rather than do a convolution that's gridded, we tend to instead have a filter that's just a function of the distance between a convolution center, which is usually an atom, and its neighbors. You have some radial cutoff. You say, okay, these are my neighbors. Uh, this is the radial vector r. It gets plugged into this learnable function w, and that's how you evaluate your filter um, in kind of the continuous convolution case. So none of that is specific to equivariant neural networks. This is just how you generalize convolutional neural networks to um, continuous systems that are on a grid. The part that is different is this part our special constraint in order to maintain symmetry. And we can provably separate our filters into a radial component and an angular component, much like the same way that we separate the wave function of the hydrogen atom into an angular and a radial component. The math, the math reasons are actually exactly the same. So the radial component is completely learned. That can just be a regular old neural network, nothing special about that part, but the angular part we have as the spherical harmonics, which are the same angular functions that actually describe hydrogenic wave functions. So we have our, our s orbitals, which are l equals zero, p orbitals, which are l equals one, d orbitals, f orbitals, and so forth. Okay, so spherical harmonics and irreps play very nicely with each other. In fact, the spherical harmonics um, are the are functions that transform as the irreducible representations of a slightly smaller group, SO3, so rotations without the inversion. And they transform as specific irreps in our network. So we're already good to go. We already know how to multiply these things together. So our filters will actually transform as kind of a, a direct sum or a concatenation of different irreps according to which angular frequency harmonic they're using. So that's very naturally handled sort of by everything we've already talked about. So what do these look like? Okay, so I should I usually break this one down, so I apologize. Usually I only show you the top part first. So let's focus, I'll walk you through it. Let's focus on this octahedral environment. I have an atom and it's octahedrally coordinated by six other atoms. And the relative distance vector between this atom I and J, let's say it's this one. And what I wanna do is I want to project this neighbor onto spherical harmonics. This is very analogous to what's done in a convolutional filter, but the reason I'm doing this is just, I want you to get some intuition for what the spherical harmonics give us. So if I were to just project this single vector, and the way I do that is I just literally evaluate the spherical harmonics at that point and then attach it to sort of this basis function. 
And if I plot that, I get something that looks like this. If we go up to, let's say, L equals six. So not too high, not too low. And it's just a blob that's at that point. And I can compute this projection for all of these neighbors, and I'll get the following six plots, which are identical, just rotated, which makes sense. It's the same neighbor, just rotated. Last but not least, and here's what really makes spherical harmonics quite beautiful. If I want to now represent the entire environment, all these six neighbors together, I simply just add up the coefficients. It's a linear vector space. And so I can just describe the entire environment by adding up these coefficients and I get this lovely octahedral signal. So what that looks like, if you actually plot the coefficients is the following. And so the single points, the single six points have coefficients that look like this. So purple is gonna be positive, orange, negative, and the magnitude is gonna be kind of the saturation. So the closer it is to gray, the smaller it is, and the less gray it is, is the larger it is. And what we're literally doing is we're just summing up all these coefficients to get the signal of the octahedron. The thing I wanna kind of show you and emphasize here, which might kind of hint at why going to higher L can be really helpful for certain types of environments is that a typical signature of high symmetry objects like an octahedron is that you'll have cancellation of lower angular frequency terms. So the L equals one, L equals two, and L equals three coefficients actually completely cancel for an octahedron. You might say, well, is anything really an octahedron? Good point. Um, but this is actually quite robust. So let's say I take my octahedron and I distort it. I add noise to where the points are. And then I redo my projection and I look at the spherical harmonics again. So this is barely perceptible noise. This is starting to get more perceptible. And then this is like really noisy. Like I, I question whether this is really an octahedron anymore. And what you can see is that even as I add a substantial amount of noise, this cancellation is fairly robust. So even in this case, it, you're basically still gonna see that it is somewhat similar, that it is like analogous to an octahedron. It's just a distorted version. So things to notice, one, these values continuously change with continuous distortion. And two, symmetry is not binary. You still get these cancellations for things that are maybe mostly symmetric, but not all the way. Um, you can also, if this is helpful to you, you can think of this as a Fourier transform over angular space. And these lower Ls are the lower frequency components. And so noise on lower frequency components is just not gonna change very much. Now, if you go to higher frequency Ls, that's where you'll detect even the most minute change. But as you do your Fourier expansion, the lower terms um, are still gonna be very stable. Okay, now I think we have about 15 minutes for applications, maybe about that, or maybe a little bit less. I we're, we're good on time. We have like uh, 28 minutes left. Okay, 28 minutes, but I wanna make sure there's time for questions too. Exactly, yeah. Um, because normally I take actually questions during the talk, but I understand that hybrid formats are, or or uh, Zoom formats can be can be challenging for that. True, true for YouTube. Okay, <laughs> so I just dragged you through a bunch of group theory, whether you like it or not. Hopefully you liked it. Why did I do this? What does it give us? Um, well, it turns out we've done a lot of fun things with it, and I'm really excited to show it to you. So one thing is that if you even just use the base mathematical operations that I talked about. Uh, we can actually do a lot of analysis in um, comparing different local environments, comparing different unit cells, and even doing analysis on high entropy alloys, which are a very exciting um, kind of class of materials to, to understand and find both short and long range correlations in. So here are some of my lovely group members. And uh, one thing we've been focusing on is called the bispectrum. So if you were to take a local environment, I'm showing my, my favorite octahedron here, you take a projection, a spherical harmonic projection, and let's call that X, all those coefficients, and that's X. If you take the triple tensor product of X with itself, and you extract just the scalar information, so there's a lot of other stuff that gets created too, but we're just gonna forget about that for now. Um, what you can do is that you have an invariant descriptor that is smooth under distortion and also displays a lot of zeros, so the white 
in this picture is going to be zeros. And again, purple is positive, orange is negative, and the bigger the magnitude, the brighter the color shows. So not only do we get a descriptor of, for example, these local environments, this distortion from a octahedron to a trigonal prism, which is just a little triangular box, it's smooth. And it's actually pretty easy to interpret. A lot of these zeros indicate that these are high symmetry objects that have particular symmetries in particular directions. Us using the bispectrum here is not new. So SOAP, if you're familiar with SOAP descriptors, also use dot products and bispectrum and high order things. Here, what we're doing is we're kind of, we're, we're removing the radial function, which can often lead to having lots and lots of parameters. Um, and instead, our only radial function is weighing how far away the neighbors are. So this really simplifies the expression. And then we're using this to do a variety of analysis on CSD, ICSD. Um, and one of the things that's really fun that you can do is that uh, Tung in particular has been looking on uh, how do you use this bispectra if you cluster a variety of environments, in this case, we were looking at silver sulfur environments, and you cluster these bispectra, you actually get back out kind of the commonly known and loved coordination environments, things like an octahedron or a tetrahedron or a bent linear T-shaped trigonal prism seesaw, single neighbor trigonal planar. And they just kind of emerge from your clustering. Um, this isn't the only thing we're doing, but it's, it's kind of a nice sanity check that it's really capturing the types of things like coordination environments, which we, re which we really care about. Alyssa has been focusing on using the bispectra in a different context, in this case, with radial functions. And we've been working closely with crystallographers on the problem of when you're doing discovery for new crystals that may have very different structures from, from what's already known, the first thing you have to do with an XRD pattern is identify the lattice. And this can actually be quite challenging. Furthermore, um, describing a unit cell is riddled with conventions. What is A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma? Um, typically we use conventions for how to choose the standard setting. But in reality, what we're really describing is a lattice object. And so what we're trying to do here, or what we are excited to see if this helps, is instead of going from XRD to alpha, beta, gamma, ABC, we're instead going to this bispectra representation, which is convention free. We basically choose all the reciprocal lattice points within some K cutoff, which can be interpreted as up to what energy are you sensitive to in your XRD. Um, and making the prediction that way. And we can actually invert between these bispectra and the original geometry that generated it. That's kind of the secret sauce of why we even do this. Um, so that's been kind of exciting to see. And this is just using tensor interactions. There's no machine learning here necessarily. I mean, maybe for clustering and then for models that predict these quantities, but the bispectra itself is, is kind of fixed. Um, in collaboration with Rodrigo Freitas' group, he's a professor in DMSC and his wonderful students, Kilian Yifan. Um, they've been using E3NN, just initialized with random parameters to be able to differentiate between the numerous types of unique motifs in high entropy alloys. So if I have a high entropy alloy and I have individual chemical environments, I can represent that as a graph um, in 3D space, give it to E3NN, get a bunch of scalars out, and actually assess the similarity and dissimilarity of these many different environments in these huge unit cells. And using these descriptors, um, you're really easily able to track populations of motif as a function of temperature um, to identify short range chemical order. You know, And so we can measure the difference between a random population of these motifs and the populations that we see through MD simulations. Uh, this is also, this is on archive if you're interested. I, I have all the numbers kind of written in the corner. And if anyone needs me to go back to something later to write down the number, let me know. Um, furthermore, you can, you know, even do even further analysis from this and identify correlating, you know, lo specific local environments with increasing lattice distortion. So there's a lot of like fun analysis that these types of robust invariant ge geometry driven features kind of enable. So we're very excited to be working with Rodrigo's group on this. Um, furthermore, one focus of the group is let's just build better equivariant neural networks using all the latest and greatest techniques from across machine learning, from natural language processing to computer vision. And so Elon and my group, and also our wonderful collaborators at Meta. Um, so Elon first worked on Equiformer, which was sort of the first equivariant graph attention transformer. 
uh, which was published in iClear 2023. And it was the first equivariant transformer to be state of the art on multiple atomistic benchmarks. That was like a really, that was something we were very excited about. And then with our lovely uh, meta collaborators, we developed Equiformer V2, which can go to higher angular frequencies. Um, and with Equiformer V2, we're currently state of the art on Open Catalysis 2020, Open Catalysis 2022, and the Open Direct Air Capture um, database that recently came out. Um, and there's even like a little interactive demo app. So if you go to those websites, you can kind of actually get kind of semi real time predictions from these models. Definitely much faster than running a DFT calculation. Yeah, so these played are around. the those, energy those are forces. You played around with it? Okay, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, we were, we were super really nice thrilled time. that like, yeah, super thrilled that they were they they were um, using Equiformer V2 for that. So it's, it's been a super fun collaboration. Um, so this is, uh, this is, it's been a fun model and, and there's so many things left to try. So we're very excited to take Equiformer and its descendants um, and apply them to more diverse data sets. Uh, another recent thing that we've been working on is predicting phonons of crystals. Uh-oh, <laughs> my battery. Um, okay, I, we're gonna migrate. I apologize. I strongly underestimated how much energy it takes to broadcast for Zoom. No worries. Take your time. Okay. All right. Hopefully it is appeased and hopefully it doesn't mess up the Zoom too much. All right. Wow, Great. these look really good. <laughs> Thank you. Even the bad ones. Um, okay. Computer is reconsidering what is life. Okay. We're good. Wonderful. So an important thing here is, so you can get phonons from existing interatomic potentials, right? So getting phonons is not necessarily new. Uh, what's new here is that we're really investigating what do you get by training on the Hessian and only force data in the first supercell. So like not even a supercell. So just the unit cell as is, you need some sort of force benchmark because as you take derivatives, you need constant offsets. Um, and you know, this is a model that is trained on forces and Hessians. And yeah, even the bad examples are not too bad. And I think the equivariant features here are really useful. Um, you're guaranteed to have interactions that symmetrically make sense. Phonons are very much determined by the symmetry of your system. So I think that really helps in this case. So this is a uh, work with Shang Fang, who's in uh, Joe Chileski's group in physics, he's a theorist in an experimental group uh, and obviously our uh, like very good friend, uh, former postdoc and now at NVIDIA, Mario Geiger. And so they've been doing this all in JAX and getting this process to be computationally tractable for training on large Hessians was a formidable task and they really did a beautiful job with it. So um, there's a workshop paper at AI for materials. So the NeurIPS workshop right now so hopefully this will get put on archive soon. But I think I think you can actually publicly see the workshop papers. So it's there, and then we'll we'll come out with a bigger uh, preprint soon. Um, but we're really excited to see what we can do with this, especially for potentially training on experimental Raman and IR data. That's like what I'm so excited about. But there's a lot of technical details for doing that. Um, all right. Oops. Okay. Hey, this is also super fun. So. Um, did I get Alan? Oh, no, okay. I was worried that I got the names out of order. So this is another project. This is uh, now in the biological space of proteins. So this is a collaboration with Joe Jacobson's group at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, so Alan and Ilan are grad students with Joe. Alan's co advised by me. And then, of course, Mario um, was instrumental in this project. And here what we're doing is that this is a coarse greening autoencoder for proteins. And the idea here is to trade geometric degrees of freedom for feature degrees of freedom in a lossless way such that we can get back the original backbone of the protein. So there's actually an all atom encoding, but we're just showing um, kind of some of, some of uh, we coarsen along the backbone. So the first step is get the all atom representation onto the backbone alpha carbons. And then we actually coarsen using a convolution across the backbone, so we go three residues per course and atom with some overlaps. You can kind of see this diagram here. And then eventually we go from 500 residues in some cases down to a single geometric point. 
Then what we do is that in a separate model, so first we have this like very lightweight autoencoder, which gives us this new compressed latent representation. Then we use a separate diffusion model to generate these latent representations, to generate new proteins. So rather than doing diffusion in the all atom picture, which would be quite annoying, um, although it's definitely doable, but it can take a long time, we actually can do diffusion on these lightweight tensor features and get out proteins that actually look pretty reasonable. Um, certainly there's some ribbons that could look better. Uh, these visualizations are like, they're sensitive to like 0.2 angstroms. They're very finicky. Um, so there's definitely room for improvement, but overall um, they generate really good proteins. And then additionally, just the latent space that the autoencoder learns um, has some really interesting properties. So if you were to look at like opening and closing, like some kind of complex conformations of proteins, um, this latent space actually beautifully, if you interpolate between these two states, it does it beautifully in a way that's like physically plausible versus if you did it in the original space, it would look horrendous. Like if you did a linear interpolation, it would just look like your protein just like sheared. Um, so there's a lot of beautiful properties of this latent space. We have an archive paper here. Um, and this has been a lot of fun and there's a lot of follow-up work that we're very excited to do to hopefully kind of do hierarchical generation kind of at different length scales. We also now have a autoregressive generative model for molecules, although we, we are very excited to start applying it to material systems. And we call it Symphony because it's symmetric and it uses point-centered harmonics. So kind of and point harmonics, so Symphony. And this is great work with um, Amea and Song and Mario. And what this does is there are autoregressive molecular generation techniques, but they typically use invariant networks. And in order to do placement, you place an atom one at a time. In order to figure out where to place that atom next with an invariant network, you actually need to use like triangulation. So you actually need the outputs of many different atoms in order to place the um, new atom. And we wanted to see if we could do it just with the features on a single atom. So we do the following kind of, we embed kind of what's going on with the current fragment of the molecule. We predict where do we want to attach the next atom. So that's our focus. And then just using the features on that focus atom, we figure out what kind of atom do we want to place and where do we want to put it? So in this case, we learn an actual angular distribution from the single atom and then sample that placement right there. And so far it is better performing than invariant autoregressive models. And we're approaching the accuracy of certain diffusion models. We're not quite there yet. I think we can iron some things out with our radial function prediction, but it's looking really good and it's very flexible and lightweight. This thing is not hard to train. It trains in like, you know, maybe a day if you really, really want to nail like certain metrics, but even in a few hours, you get something pretty usable, which is very exciting. Um, last but not least, yes. Um, let's talk about symmetry breaking because not only do physical systems have certain symmetric properties, they also break symmetry, but they break it in a very specific way. So as I mentioned, equivariant neural networks can, they must have outputs that are the same symmetry or higher than the inputs. So here's an example where that breaks. So let's say I have a square and I'm using, and in this case, we're, we're working a lot with um, fluid dynamic simulation. So we're working in images, but this also works in, in just 3D point space. So let's say I have a square and I wanna turn it into a rectangle. Square is higher symmetry than the rectangle. So as you might suspect, this doesn't quite work. What the best thing an equivariant model can do is say, okay, well, I'm gonna predict what I can. Like you told me to produce this rectangle. I can't really do that. But did you know that there are two symmetrically equivalent rectangles? Which is just really cool. So it's like, you give it one thing and it's like, well, obviously this is implied. So this is the implied rectangle, right? So how do we, you know, how do we get that out? Um, so we're doing a variety of things on this. Actually, a separate work that I won't have time to mention is actually figuring out how to predict sets of predictions to actually predict both sets. But there can even be circum circumstances where you really are predicting, you're going from this to this, and it's because there's missing information. So one thing you can do is that you can actually use, there's certain guarantees you have in not only the forward prediction, but the gradients. The gradients have certain symmetry properties. And so you can actually find that 
um, if you allow the model to learn additional irreps, you initialize them at zero, but they, they can learn new features, it'll learn to only break the symmetries needed to do the task. And so what it learns is it learns the sort of cosine two theta term. So this is now the irreps of 2D. So these are the circular kind of harmonics, if you will. And it learns that X is different than Y. And it learns this and it's able to do the task. And this is all symmetrically guaranteed. Where we're using this now is we're just using this process to find symmetry applied missing data. So whether it's for specific phase transitions of materials or what's causing different dynamics, um, like is there a buoyancy force that's breaking symmetry in these fluid dynamic simulations? What if you didn't give me the vector? Can I recover that vector just from a model that's been trained to see different vectors of uh, buoyancy force and these strong symmetry guarantees that we get from the model? Answer is yes. Um, so this will be coming out hopefully soon. There's actually a workshop paper on a subset of this work um, on 3D relaxed octahedral convolutions with Ray and Robin and myself. And that will be at the AI for Science workshop at NeurIPS. So if you're at NeurIPS. Um, but we'll also, I think this is also on archive. Um, and uh, yeah, but hopefully more, more stuff coming soon. Open questions. We still don't know the best way of using equivariant neural networks. There's probably still a lot of creativity for building blocks. Um, there are computational bottlenecks in current equivariant networks. These are quickly being eliminated, actually. This has been some really exciting um, work, even in the most recent conference cycle. Um, so tensor products have traditionally been kind of slow for a variety of reasons, but this is because they really haven't received the same love and attention as the traditional operations using deep learning frameworks. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about this. I think, I think it's gonna get solved pretty soon. Um, and you can be part of this, there's still a lot to do. Uh, equivariant generative models, beautiful area, so much to do between diffusion, autoregressive models. There's still issues with like, how do we deal with large numbers of point systems? How do we handle like hierarchies at different scales? So not only like, short scale, long scale, but also um, hierarchies of like different symmetries. So how do we kind of natively handle these in our generative models? How do we lay down entire patterns or motifs? We'd love to, we're currently working on trying to figure out if we can use symphony, not only to lay down in individual atoms, but entire environments at a time, which would help that kind of exponential scaling. Uh, and then there's just a lot of training practices. Like these are neural networks, they require good engineering. And so there's a lot of stuff to do in that. So I will show my takeaways, but first I want to thank my group, these lovely, lovely people that make work so much fun, uh, make research so much fun. My collaborators, which also make all of this so much fun. Uh, and of course the funding sources, which allow us to keep the lights on, especially like a lot of the graduate fellowships are funding a lot of the students in the group. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of them. So I'm gonna leave these takeaways the reiteration of many of the things that I've said in this talk, and I will happily take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Tess, for this wonderful talk. You you do a great job of explaining these advanced topics in a very, I would say, very visual, very approachable way. This was this was great. We do have questions, actually, some already in the Q&A panel. I will also say oh. to all the attendees, feel free to raise your hand, and then if you're if you're called upon, just unmute yourself and ask the question in person if you like. I'll start reading some of the written questions. One here is from Mingjian Wen, who says, thanks, Tess. There are some instances, e.g. separate works by Michelle Seriotti and Zach Ulissi, showing that models without symmetries strictly baked in can have greater flexibility and learn, in, in quotes, better on some data sets. Any comments on strictly enforcing the symmetries via equivariant models versus learning approximate symmetry via loss function or data augmentation? Sure, yeah, so great question. Um, I do wonder, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of this stuff that I would need to interrogate the model myself to really understand better. One thing I suspect is I wonder if these models generalize as well as equivariant networks, um, or I just wonder what the generalization properties are. I do believe it is much easier for a non-equivariant model to sometimes achieve certain accuracies um, but sometimes accuracy is not the best um, metric for performance. Um, there are a lot more training techniques available for more general models. So it's, it's a little bit hard to disentangle 
what is better engineering practices? Like that was a huge thing for Equiformer is that like Elon just did so much care and feeding of the model in addition to really figuring out some very tricky normalization issues, especially between version one and version two. So I certainly think it is possible to get good accuracies without equivariance. I am not certain that it's learning the representations you want it to learn. Um, and you know, it can depend on it can depend on what you want. Like maybe maybe that's fine. Um, I sleep a little bit better at night knowing if my representations are equivariant, but maybe I'm a stick in the mud. So I think it's an excellent issue to bring up. And I would love to see more papers and benchmarks on this. I also suspect that there is a dynamics issue. So training dynamics is a really interesting question. Like is being equivariant throughout the training dynamics harmful? And this is a separate question that we're actually investigating um, with Ray and Alyssa and Robin, especially because Ray has previously done work in relaxed equivariant models. So to be seen, like, is there a way that we can kind of get the, you know, favorable training dynamics, maybe if, if this is the case, like if the, if the training dynamics are more favorable for non-equivariant models, but then can we kind of bring it back onto the manifold of equivariant functions? So lots of things to do there. So great, great question. And I hope I didn't overload you with like 60 different answers. No, I mean, lots, lots of great ideas in there. I, I agree. Benchmarks are great. And um, maybe trying to combine, yeah, loosen the symmetry constraints a little bit during training time. That's that's certainly an interesting question. Uh, we have another question from Senshu Li. I hope I'm saying that right. Wonderful talk, and thanks a lot, Tess. May I ask a question related with my case? I encountered a situation that I input two structures A and B. They are the same, but have different coordinates due to different 0, 0, 0 site choice. When I apply a covariant transformation, coordinates of A and B transform to two different representations. If these representations are used for further neural networks, since they are mapping to the same energy, will there be some residue of error coming from this procedure? Yeah, okay. So if if the two crystals are actually the same thing, just a, it's a coordinate system issue. So if if things are kind of, you know, and, and getting things in the right setup, it's always a... Um, something to be careful of with any neural network. But if, if you're very certain that it is really representing the same structure, I would recommend using the scalars if you're going to use a downstream task. So don't use the equivariant parts because that will be different. It's supposed to be different if you're using kind of a different setting or different coordinate system that may be different. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're using the scalars and they really are the same physical system, you should be safe there. OK. Another question from Temujin Bayara. Nice talk. How about systems without symmetry? Can E3 and N learn structural motifs in amorphous materials? Absolutely, because it's the symmetry of the underlying like patterns that you'd want to learn. It's not the symmetry of the object. So if you put in a low symmetry object, then the output can have the same low symmetry as long as that symmetry is like a subgroup. So we not only like Euclidean symmetry is kind of like the highest symmetry. Um, that the model can deal with in, in a sense. Um, so I actually think this would be particularly good for glasses if you want to learn motifs because of this sort of like continuous um, kind of features over spherical harmonics. So I think actually recognizing when you have many distortions of similar motifs, I think it'd actually be particularly good at that. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe I can throw in a question of my own here. So in the in the very beginning, you showed this plot, the log lock plot of uh, training or, or model error versus training set size, mm -hmm. and you showed that there there can be instances where, by increasing the the maximum angular feature, you get uh, a steeper learning curve. But my understanding is that that also comes with quite a sharp increase in in inference cost and maybe even training cost. So yeah, what... that certainly used to be the case. There's um, a really nice computational trick that first showed up in equivariant spherical channel networks. And there's also now a like Gaunt tensor product paper that's out that kind of shows that there's various ways in which um, uh, you may not hit a huge computational cost by doing that. But certainly like if if you're using kind of like some of the naive tensor products that we have implemented in E3NN, it can be very expensive. Um, but that might not necessarily be the case. So the equivariant spherical channel networks has a very beautiful description of how you can like leverage different symmetries in the convolution to actually make it a, a much more efficient operation. That's what we use in Equiformer V2. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part part of it. Um, was there another part to your question? I feel like I didn't answer the full thing. 
so just to re reiterate so you're saying there's engineering tricks basically you can do to to mitigate the cost of higher tensor features and then they're generally worth it like would you say you have to be careful when you turn these on or, or how high you go or... I think eventually you won't, but I think currently as we're kind of going through the growing pains of as a community figuring out all these tricks, I'm um, actually recently uh, recently a student joined my group who, who's a, a GPU performance person. And so oh, um, they're really whipping our, uh, our code into shape. Um, and they're like, why did you do this? It's like, okay, sorry, we didn't know. Um, so it's great, it's great. Uh, it's, it's really fun to have a diverse a diverse group with so many different perspectives. So I, th I think eventually you won't have to be as careful. I think currently you have to be very careful uh, mm -hmm. and you have to, uh, it's a little bit more um, of, uh, you need to engineer these things, right? Or like, you know, grab the convolution from equivariant circle channel networks or the one that Equiformer uses that's, that's heavily, um, based on on that one so so follow-up question actually from john in the chat uh you mentioned a paper that showed you you can go you mentioned gone tensor product what paper is this is he asking uh it's under review at um i clear and so i cannot say who the authors are i see, I see. it's not is us it it's not us it's someone else it's on open review okay so if you search like gone tensor product i clear 2024 um interesting paper uh like and and what's nice is that you'll get to see all like the comments and stuff we have we, our group has one comment on there um very enthusiastic and some clarifying questions so yeah there you go john that, that should yeah. cover all but the I, it's, it's 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 anonymous so i can't say who it is right right um actually maybe one one more question for me you showed the 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 phonon model so how did you get Yay. inspired to train on the second derivative on the Hessian, how did that idea start? How did this start? I think it's. I think it started with Sean. I think Sean came to us. Um. I mean, I think it was also. Jax is so beautiful <laughs> for doing differentiation. Um, that I think it was sort of begged the question of like, what is a beautiful way to do training on phonons and so there's a bunch of linear algebra for like doing projection tricks to make this efficient mm -hmm. um but i also i also really like the potential application of, di of directly comparing to vibrational spectra um and ir and raman so i mean there's a bunch of complexities of how do you actually go about doing that and correlating like the peak to the right modes but it's such a symmetry based thing that it, it seems like it should be something we can nail and then you can like pre-train with DFT and then train on experimental data and then it's like okay great DFT just gets us part of the way there but we can trust experiment more <laughs> so um it'd be interesting to see if that can lead to actually better interatomic potentials because it's all trained in the same framework there's no reason why you can't train on that spectra but then use it for and I, and I don't think we're like unique in that way of thinking I think everyone's kind of like wants to do this and just figuring out the right we yeah, actually, go about the, the nail on the head there for why I'm very excited about this particular project. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah, agree. I think yeah. that's a very exciting opportunity. I was wondering, so you're training on directly the, the vast Hessians that you get from DFPT calculations? I think so. I think it's DFPT. I, or I don't know. We might be doing super cells. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we're doing super cells. I'll have, to, I'll have to check with Sean actually because he's doing the calculations as well um so I'll need to ask specifically because yeah there's there's basically kind of like a couple different ways that you traditionally will calculate phonons with fast and one of them is mm -hmm. sort of the perturbation theory way and one of them is a supercell way and I actually don't quite remember I think it was the perturbation theory way but um yeah Makes sense. Uh, so not to hijack this meeting any further there's a question from <laughs> <laughs> Amadeo uh, Scaramella could you kindly comment on the best building blocks applications with some examples or relevant research on the topic? Thanks. Mm, okay. Um, I think there's a lot of building blocks to build for generative models. I, don't, I really don't think we've exhausted that. So, so there's sort of like regression tasks and that's, you know, that's where things like Equifor are really training these things into the ground and coming up with really well-behaved, easy to train, like, building blocks there's a lot of work to do there but it's going to be a lot of like normalization a lot of like these really technical aspects of training um i think as far as like building blocks where we 
we just need to try a lot of things. I mean, it's still the case for regression tasks, but I think generative models, there's just, there's a lot of diffusion stuff out there, which diffusion's great. Like it's, it's awesome. Um, I still, I still want more hierarchical representations and, and there's still like, you know, stable diffusion, all this sort of stuff. And there's like all the flows. And so there's a lot of good stuff out there, but I feel like we can be even, even more cheeky about how we're generating structures. So I, I think that's kind of some of the areas with the most fun building blocks. But then I, I'm sure that kind of more engineering techniques are, are what's going to get us to like models that are trained on like all the data that just really are well behaving under training conditions. So maybe maybe that's some directions. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers your your question, Amadeo. So I think we're already five minutes over time here, and uh, in the interest of, of respecting everyone's schedule, maybe this would be a, a good time to call it a day. Uh, we can, by the way, we're very happy to, so you, you had a bunch of archive links up on many of the yeah. slides. We're happy to put them in the description of the YouTube channel if you, oh, if you want. Oh, perfect. To okay, afterwards. cool, cool. That, that would allow me to track down some of the open review stuff for the workshop papers, which yeah. are not anonymized now. So, um, yeah. And we can I also share the slides that. if you like, but that's Perfect, yeah. I always have it on Google Slides just for that reason, so. Wonderful. So th thank you very much for coming on, for giving this this great talk. Thanks for having me. And thank you everyone for the questions. I love it. All right. With that, thanks everybody for joining today. And we'll uh, let you know when we have our next MP seminar in January, where Alan is actually coming on to come uh, to talk about the AC consortium, acceleration consortium. That'll be an inter interesting talk as well. That'll be super fun. He's always a fun guy. Have a great day, everybody. And thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me.